Good morning and welcome to Bright Talk at Black Hat. Um, we're happy you could join us today. We are uh, going to take about an hour and we're going to talk a little bit about um, the changing role of the CISO, but since we have such a uh, since an, an astute audi uh, pan group of panelists here today, uh, we're going to go around the block a little bit. Um, have a number of, uh, of things I want to talk about, questions that I want to ask uh, the panelists, and then we're also going to take questions live, so feel free to, uh, to send those in, and we will, if we can get to them, we will get to the questions. Uh, my name is Mark Weatherford. I am the Chief Cybersecurity Strategist at vArmor. Uh, we're a cloud, center, cloud and data center security company. Um, and uh, I've, done, I've been a CISO a number of times, uh, a number of different organizations, so I still keep my finger on the pulse of what is happening in the, uh, in the CISO community and the kind of the challenges that today's CISO faces. So I'm going to turn it over to the audience or to the panelists here and have each one of the panelists introduce themselves for a couple of minutes. Uh, tell a little bit about who they are and the company they're working with, and then we'll jump right into the questions. So, Mark, let's start with you. Um, Mark Whitehead, I'm a director of Spider Labs in the Americas for TrustWave. Spider Labs is our elite hacker uh, incident response security researcher group inside of TrustWave. Um, never been a CISO myself, but have spent um, numerous uh, conversations and hours with CISOs advising them on how to um, better secure their environments. Great. Ozzy? Uh, my name is Ozzy Cohen. Um, I'm the founder and general manager for White Source, White Source software that uh, provides uh, open source lifecycle management solution for high enterprises. Uh, by my accent, you can understand I'm an Israeli, uh, but I'm living in uh, New York for the past nine years. I've been de doing uh, security uh, from the vendor side for the past almost 20 years, so I met with CISOs all around the world and like yourself trying to stay in touch with what they care about what uh, you know what they see meaningful what they try to protect themselves against how, how to decide what to do uh, it's a very challenging market and uh, we're happy to be at the tip right now in what we are doing and see the changes coming over great thank you joe yes my name is joe kuchik i'm the chief security officer at calvin systems and we provide hyper cloud solutions for our customers um, and I and I've had the luxury of being a CISO when I was at General Motors. I'm not sure I would call it luxury. But <laughs> uh, well, it's an interesting experience, let's say the least. <laughs> um, and then I've also uh, was number two security operations executive at Citigroup. Um, and besides that, I worked at KPMG, PwC, and CA, and supported a lot of customers. And my last role was at uh, Verizon, where I created the Verizon Risk Report, and I was in the security product organization there. Wow, that's great. We're going to have to have a conversation after the conversation. Sure. So let's start. First question, uh, you know, kind of the, the premise of the, of the panel here is, what's the changing role of the, of the CISO? So start with you, Mark. And, you know, even though you haven't been one, you, you've spent a lot of time with CISOs. What do you see as the challenge and how that role has evolved? Yeah, I mean, so the numerous ones I've been advising, I find they have really um, focused in on three key traits. The, the first is they're very good at prioritization. So they can do the daily task and balance proactive versus reactive, but they also um, can paint the picture for what they want the organization to be when they mature. So when they f focus on do we want to protect better, do we want to defend better, or do we want to respond better, each of those has different sets of technology and people b beside them. But when they pick that focus area, uh, the next thing they're able to do very well is budget, right? You can't secure without a budget. So I think they're able to put that picture in place and get um, the budget they need to, to focus on the areas they care about. And the third piece with that is once they have all that, they're very good at retaining um, staff and keeping a culture around them of people who want to engage and and defend with them mm -hmm. and and so i think as you probably have noticed you'll see as sisters move around whole groups will move with them yeah. because of those um those three characteristics yeah i'm sure joe you probably have I, I, as you've gone around you probably have those four or five people that you're like okay wherever i go i want you guys to follow me 
Uh, yes, it's true. I, uh, when I, was, I had one person work for me at uh, AOL, followed me to KPMG, followed me to Network Associates, back to KPMG. I've had another one work for me, General Motors, followed me to City, followed me to Verizon. So um, there's, there's always a, a group of people you trust that helps make your job easier, right? Yeah. And you can just delegate and know that they understand what you want and they'll be able to address it. Yeah, for sure. So um, Ozzy, yeah, I mean, again, you haven't been a CISO, sure. but you worked with a lot of companies. Yeah, and actually, you know, obviously the role of the CSO changed so much in the past few years, but I think that the biggest change that I see in the past two years, maybe due to this Equifax thing, is that security is reported to the board, board of directors. Yeah. This is a huge change. How do you explain why you decided to put X amount of budget here versus here as a security guy and explain it to the board of directors. And they don't care about, you know, patches and vulnerabilities and they need to understand how the business grows and where is the risk and how you mitigate it, right? So the entire need to be able to speak with those people, explain to them and, and CISOs today go to the board meetings. They, they present yeah. the case there, right? I think that this is the biggest change. It, uh, you know, it's actually, I think it's a very positive change because it forces them also to look at the issues from different angle. For sure. Um, and, and I've seen some that have, could, that have done a good job there and I've seen some that, it, you know, they felt miserable, you know, yeah. they're not used to that. So that. For me, that's the biggest change in the past, let's say, two years or so. Yeah, well, I would say I would say what really contributed to that a lot was the National Association of Corporate Directors. It's a publication of the cyber risk um, oversight pamphlet that came out in 2017. Because I was actually meeting earlier this year, where presenting a solution to to CISO, and then. And I was telling him about this, he started laughing at me. I said, did I say something funny? He goes, my CEO already asked the CIO and myself, where's our cybersecurity dashboard? But yeah. By the way, there is another aspect to that. So, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, that's okay. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the CISOs are buying products, right, or solutions for security. But the vendors are not there. The vendors sell feature functions, yeah. you know. So once more, being able to translate that in, into the, to the business level, it, it's really a challenge. So I, I think that, you know, I think Equifax had a lot to do with that, by the way. Uh, you know, but um, yeah, I think that this is... So uh, to, to jump on that just a little bit, um, I've always been on the operational side of, okay. of information security. And now I am with a vendor and I, my, we do sell stuff. Um, so uh, I, I spent a lot of time, I still spend a lot of time with our salespeople helping and coaching them and how to present the product to a CISO in a way that gets them interested sure. because you know a lot of salespeople are, are more coin operated than they are interested in being a partner to to the company they're selling to and CISOs today honestly don't have um, don't have the bandwidth to deal with all of the products I mean you, you, you walk out here on the floor at at Black Hat this afternoon, and you'll see the thousands of different companies out there that that um, you know there's not a smidgen of difference in 90% of the companies out sure. there. So, mm -hmm. one of the other things that interesting, and in, I think, in at least that I've noticed in the changing role of the CISO is when I first got in this business, it was e you it was easy and expected to be considered the expert. Today there's nobody that can be an expert because there's too many different facets and components of security to be what I consider an expert in everything. So It's more running a business of security yeah. inside of an organization. Yeah, for sure, absolutely. Yeah. So, Ozzy, kind of back on your budget question. So, you know, traditionally and historically we've looked at, okay, we're going to spend on network security. Right. How has that changed and where do you see people prioritizing their discretionary budgets these days? So I think, you know, I, I think that companies and CSOs, CSOs start to understand that they um, have been putting too much budget on the network side. It was easy, you know, it's there for 20, 30 years, so a lot of practices have been developed. But, um, I, and actually the latest report uh, showed that, um, you know, network security is over, overrated right now or over budgeted versus if you go to the application side. It's it's you know it's on the downside yeah. and, and the risk there is much higher. Uh, clients have more applications today, 
than ever, right? Um, it's agile development, right? So the co code keep on changing all the time. So I think that there is a major shift right now where budget should shift from um, from network, um, you know, uh, controls and security uh, uh, controls into the application side. Some companies are already doing that. Uh, there is a whole component of open source, we can discuss it later if you want, um, that has its own flavor, uh, but definitely uh, the need to protect against uh, uh, against attacks from the application side, I believe it's it's the next frontier and, and CISOs have to pay attention to that. So, um, so I, I agree with you. Um, how do, how does the shift um, into cloud um, technology, because the cloud is, has taken over the world. How does the shift to cloud, um, how does that impact that budgeting for the for development of applications and the shift of applications? The application is out there. Yeah. You know, um, and by, by the way, I'll take it once more, I'll take the open source example, right? When you use open source to develop a web application, okay, you are obliged to uh, release a, a report that's called Attribute Report that includes all the open source components that are included there. Basically, you publish all the open source that is included in these web applications and all the vulnerabilities that comes with it. So you basically tell the world, hey, I just developed this great application or this great house, but I left this door open and the garage door is always stayed up, etc. right? So, Especially in web application and some also mobile application, when we publish, when client publish those, they actually publish all the vulnerabilities and leave them out in the cloud for people to try to figure out where those vulnerabilities yeah. are and hacking. This is, and I don't want to beat on Equifax, but this is the case of Equifax, right? Exactly the case. So uh, web made it so easy for others to hack in, and actually, you know, it's funny. People think of hackers. It's those guys that try to figure out this amazing way to do that and then that and then that to figure how to get into the database. No, they just go and scroll and find an unpatched system, go to the uh, NVD, find the open vulnerabilities, how to hack them, and do it 10 times a day. Yeah. So um, I think that this is, uh, you know, obviously using the cloud is a necessity. It created the, you know, it basically opened the, the, uh, the clients or the developers to new form of attack, many more attackers, and they have to pay attention to that. I'm gonna come back to open source later because I have, I have some thoughts I wanna get your, uh, your opinion on. So Mark, we, we talk about testing a lot. Testing, mm -hmm. of, I mean, and there's a lot of different things you could test. Mm -hmm. um, so give us some flavor what, you, what kinds of things you think we should be testing and how do CISOs, how should CISOs view testing as a kind of a critical component of their strategy? Yeah, I mean, and it's an important one for, for a CISO as, as you're highlighting with application security and those are things that we would test. You know, we were trying to figure out at my company a way to just create a, a common way to chat with CISOs about their maturity. The conversations always started with, well, how do we do compared to our competitors or always, our verticals, right? Always. And so we never felt that was a fair conversation to really have. And what we really wanted to focus on was the individual uh, CISO we're talking with, but some repeatability to it. So we put together a maturity model to help them understand how mature they are in a testing environment. So we tend to look at um, whether you're interested in protection, detection, or response as a CISO. And so when you look at protection, we, the two scans we normally recommend are a discovery scan and a vulnerability assessment. So, so you're, though, you're, you're, equa you're saying that scanning is, is part of that testing. It is that testing piece of it's, that. It, okay. It's one part of it, right? So when you go to a discovery scan, that's really for a CISO to identify all of their assets. And we have more conversations than not with a new incoming CISO. <laughs> and you're like, what? Well, I have you all have that? Yeah. So, um, so this discovery stand, scam really gets that conversation started. Then once you know all of that, you kick off a vulnerability scan, which then on all those assets are there vulnerabilities that are known. And then when we try and but, mature with them and see if they're a maturing um, organization, we move into um, 
the pen testing realm. And, and that is really for detecting, right? So we're trying to see, is something vulnerable and can we exploit it? How, where do we take that exploit to? A and so as an organization, you wanna start detecting that activity in your network. Um, and then once you do that, we move you more to the response phase because you, you know all your assets, you're detecting activity, and then we, in the response phase is when we run organizations through exercises, such as a red team or a purple next, team, yeah. right? And they're fun for my team, they enjoy them, and, and I feel when an organization is mature enough and ready for them, they're one of the best mechanisms to test all your people, processes, technology, and see if it's all orchestrated correctly. So, jumping on that, the exercise, I agree, by the way, I think the exercise is one of the ways that an organization can judge their maturity really quickly. Real quick, yeah. But do you bring, do you typically try to bring um, other people from within, within the organization, like the CEO, like the COO, like the CFO, like the general counsel, do you bring those into some of these exercises? Yeah, so we generally have a point of contact and, and as you talk about trends, they are more senior now mm -hmm. than they used to be. And and most of our out briefs now are, are at the C-level. Um, not so much the board, I think they want to digest it and then figure out you know, what to bring up there and more the budget ask. But the, the conversations we're having with increasingly more senior members of the organization they're involved right i mean sure. uh, they need to understand the risk and it, it's one thing to get a, a vulnerability assessment with it all listed or a penetration test and yeah, yeah but when we're actually sitting and achieving goals that have a real business impact on your organization that tends to start a very proactive conversation in an organization you said something three times then for you CISOs out there keeps talking about the business aspect of this. That's such a huge piece of the CISO's role today yeah, um, that I think is. we kind of gets lost. We get so focused on the security piece, we forget that we're part of an overall business. Yeah. So Joe, um, one of the programs that I uh, started when I was at the Department of Homeland Security was, was the Continuous Diagnostic and Mitigation Program. And the, the goal of it was really to to implement um, monitoring and give visibility of the infrastructure for federal agencies. So what do you think? How do you explain uh, continuous security and how that's changing the role of the CISO? Well, um, I, first of all, I think it's a great thing that companies are starting to adopt the continuous security model, just because things have changed so much in, in the business, as you said, you know, the CISO's role has changed where the vulnerabilities are much more frequent, the, act, the actors have changed. So the ability to, on a daily, at the minimum, on a daily basis to know what your, your exposures are based on different assets and being able to then prioritize the remediation actions against that really helps, you know, improve the overall security posture of an organization. I also feel that taking that data and then being able to roll that up to leadership and to the board level becomes a critical aspect as you go forward in terms of having an integrated communication tool so that you can quickly identify where your risks are, what you're doing to address it, as well as you use that as a leverage to help drive the behavior in the organization that you need to re remediate the actions. Nobody yeah. wants to have red, nobody wants to have a low score, and especially if they know it's going to the, C, to the C level or to the board, it gets remediated much quicker without you know, the CISO getting into a challenging conversation. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And then if you're able to tie that back to the business, so when it gets to the board, well, this is your business exposure to not mitigating this issue, it makes the conversation go much quicker in terms of getting remediated. Yeah. So we have one question from the audience here, and it kind of falls right in line with, uh, with something I wanted to talk about, and that's security talent. How, you know, w w you can't, can't pick up any magazine or, or uh, rag in the security industry today that doesn't talk about the lack of security talent and, oh my God, what are we going to do about this because the sky is falling. Um, I admit it is a challenge. You know, I, I, I had probably a half dozen meetings over at Black Hat yesterday and almost every person I talked to said, yeah, we have, you know, 
10 or 15 or 20 open recs for different kinds of yeah. security talent. So what are some of the, uh, I'll start with you, Joe. What are some of your strategies that you've used to not only, to not only recruit, but to identify talent that you want to recruit? And then, you know, that kind of life cycle of, okay, you identify them, you recruit them, you hire them, how do you retain them? You know, what's that life cycle look like? And what are you, how do you deal with that? Yeah, so, so it's, I think it's always been a challenge. Security talent has always been uh, something in the marketplace that, that we've never had enough of. Uh, it's, it's just we create more, more opportunities, which creates a bigger demand. But from my perspective, when you get the, the talented people, in terms of being able to increase their level of responsibility and help them focus on automation of their activities so that the lower value tasks are automated is one quick way of retaining them because it challenged them to develop the automation solutions, moving through robotics uh, automation, um, and so I think that's one of the key areas. I think the other thing is when you're looking for talent, I think too many times we limit what we look for. I'd rather find really smart people that are quick to learn and adapt and I'll help guide them through security. I think many times we just want somebody who has a, a, the certification may not be the right long-term fit for the company. And, and I'd rather find really smart people. Like some of those people that followed me from company to company, they didn't know how to spell security when they started with me. But one of them is a practice director at at t now. Another one's a senior person at uh, uh, Verizon today. And like I said, they didn't grow up in security but we develop them over yeah. time. And I think finding smart people, to me, is more important than finding credentials. Yeah. Ozzy, any thoughts on that? Uh, you know, it's a, it's, a tough, it's a tough one, and obviously I didn't face it. Uh, but what I do see that happens right now, and that could be some practice that could help, you know, a little bit, is, uh, you know, we, we see trend like DevSecOps, right? meaning security is delegated to the DevOps. Yeah. Now, if you ask the DevSecOps people, they'll tell you that there's a shortage of talent there, right? Because we didn't create a new set of people suddenly that can do the job, right? But at least this approach of delegating certain activities, uh, because it actually makes a lot of sense, right? If you, do, if you solve the security issue when application is being created, right, obviously you solve a lot, so, so a lot of problems later. But, uh, but I think that this approach a little bit helps in on, on the security side, right? Because they delegated that to someone else that now they have to search for talent. Uh, but in general, I think that, uh, you know, this is the approach that should be taken. Mark, any thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I think it goes back, as we were talking about the evolving role of the CISO and that prioritization piece, you're competing with a lot of different companies and talent. So you need to identify if that's one of your core areas or you should look at a, a different cost-saving mechanism of outsourcing a certain responsibility. And then once you do have your talent identified, uh, it's important, I think, throughout the company to understand the shortage. So you see a lot of organizations that make a oversweeping change on a whole organization, but there need to be certain exemptions for that staff to, to really enable leaders to build the culture and make them feel somewhat like they're special because quite frankly they are special in a lot of organizations you can get a lot of people to do this task you know a lot of people get and do that task you don't have a lot of people that mm -hmm. can do the cyber security in your organization yeah that's interesting there's a number of, of uh, companies private companies but also government organizations are finding that they're having to carve out um, special kinds of circumstances to be able to pay you know people at different levels of their career differently than other people within the company yeah. um, which is very it's very non-traditional in many organizations especially in the government yeah and they're also security professionals are a unique breed in, in terms Thank of you. You, you, you know what I mean I, and so um, treating them just like anybody in a whole company is a, a turnoff for them. And it, I can't go back enough about the culture, you know, uh, especially in the, the testing, pen testing, um, a lot of people change companies, but they're all friends on the back yeah. end. And they're asking, hey, what's it like over there? 
And when you see an overarching change and the, no exception, and someone going to go for bat to bat for them and highlight it, you'll see an exodus at a whole company. Yeah. And what is really that is is the culture, and you were not able to protect the people. I, I do think though we have to caution ourselves against being arrogant, just because we're you know we have this different skill set, um, and we're in high demand. You know, you know, arrogance is not necessarily a good thing. We need to be careful of that. I think. So. Ozzy, I'm going to come back to you on, on this open source thing. Sure. Uh, so almost everybody, uh, uh, in fact, I would even venture to say everybody uses open source <laughs> today, whether they know it or not. And Gartner claims that about 60% of all web applications use, use open source. And, you know, we're seeing even very conservative verticals like banking and finance and government um, are making use of, sure. of open source more and more today. So the questions that CISOs have, I think, as, or the questions they should have, um, is how much of their code base is, it, is open source? Is it licensed is it, and is it legal? Can they determine the provenance of the code and its or origin? Um, and then more importantly, obviously, is it secure? Is it so riddled with bugs um, that, you know, that it's, it costs more and takes more time to fix it than it does to write it originally? So. What's the, what's the trend on security for open source? Um, it's a great question. I think we hear it a lot. Um, as you mentioned, um, right now the average is 60%, but it's growing, growing very fast. And if you think about it, you know, companies are required to uh, generate more and more innovation, yeah. or innovative code. They don't get more stuff, so reuse instead of build, you know, it's the most uh, common approach, and that's why more and more open source is getting into the door, right? There's no other way to achieve that. But um, with that comes a lot of risk, as I said, risk and the need to comply with the legal side, etc. And, um, and and I think that for the CISOs, there are, there are several steps of or level of maturity that I see. I see those that, um, assume that they are covered, you know, DevOps covers that, you know, they, you know, the people that do the testing, etc., they cover that. Most of them don't even know how much open source they have, right? Uh, others assume that they have some of it, uh, and, but once more, uh, many of them don't understand that solution, traditional solutions like SAST and DUST uh, that are using are not covering the open source. So that's another eye-opener for them. And the third one is, as I mentioned earlier, when you use open source component, you're actually forced to publish where the vulnerabilities are, what we're using. So um, I think that the best approach is actually what my colleague here offered. You know, and we as a company offer the same kind of approach. Start with the testing. We call it gap analysis. Okay, you gave it a different name, right? But run some kind of a scan you know, that will allow you to understand how big is your open source inventory. This is the ABC for everything. If you are good or if you have only few components and very few vulnerabilities, maybe it's great, right? But if you have a lot of them, th this is something that you can take to your manager and say, you know what, there's a gap here. I need to, uh, you know, I need to fix it. Now, the point I want to make is extremely important. There, there are two trends here. The overall number of components, open source components that are being used is growing, and the community finds more and more vulnerabilities to those. But on the other hand, hackers understand that the window to exploit them is becoming shorter. Mm -hmm. So they try to hit on unpatched system faster and faster. So that means that the CISOs today face a situation where there's more things to check and be aware of and shorter time to react. Absolutely. Right, so I think that um, you know the the most reasonable approach for CISOs that haven't done anything in this area is just to do, as I said earlier, some kind of a gap analysis. There are multiple vendors like White Source and others that can help in that. It will help them to put their arms around it, see the inventory, identify the legal aspect and the security aspect, and quantify the level of risk and take a decision. Take a decision based on numbers that they can share with their managers and sometimes with the board, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and not just by, by estimates. And uh, we see this approach growing very fast and uh, we see uh, very large companies that in the past were 
not looking at open source at all. Major banks, as you mentioned, you know, anyone. So uh, that would be my best, uh, you know, advice to those people that look into that. But definitely, you cannot ignore it. Um, you can definitely. Yeah. Uh, one, one more fact, you know, eventually the open source vulnerabilities falls under what I call the non vector, right? You have open source there. It comes with a vulnerability. You need policy. Yeah. Right. You at 2018. You cannot have there's a no black hole there, that, right? Mm -hmm. You cannot come with any excuse in the world to be, be attacked from known vulnerabilities on open source. So, yeah, um, at the CISO summit yesterday, um, Jimmy Sanders is a he's a CISO at Netflix DVD, and he gave I think one of the best talks I've ever seen on DevSecOps, okay. um, which is a huge part of. of Open source is a huge part Absolutely. of DevSecOps. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and most of the people that are on the DevSecOps side, that's exactly what they're doing. Yeah. You know, yeah. These, these cycles. Yeah. So, Joe, uh, I'm going to ask you a question. It's an unfair question. I, I will state that up front. This is not a fair question to ask Joe. Um, but um, there are a lot of challenges to moving to the cloud um, and implementing. Um, cloud strategies for a CISO today, um, and and just because there's so many moving parts, how, how do you deal with that? How do you see um, uh, CISO um, solving this, this or addressing this challenge of of this wholesale migration to the cloud? Well, um, I, the first thing I would say is I think that the enterprise customers will probably have a hybrid cloud strategy, and that's what they have to put in place. And they, they really need to understand that before they embark on this journey. So one, in terms of which, a, which assets, which applications are better to put in the cloud, which ones do you want to keep in-house, uh, because you also have to look at the applications in terms of how they'll function with a cloud operation, because a lot of them were designed for on-prem, low network latency, and same rack. Um, and you also have to look at the cloud from a business perspective. What are all the changes that we need to make to be able to support this migration and this evolution? So do we have the, the, the right skill sets? Do we have the right resources to, to monitor this process as we go forward? And also, how do we maintain security and a transparent security posture as we go through this migration. So those are the key things that I think need to be addressed by the CISO as he embarks on this journey. And in, in a lot of cases, I think the journey starts before the CISOs had a chance to plan that out, and then, then they're playing catch-up after that. And, they're, and that's why a lot of companies, the initial move to the cloud tends to be a false start or tends to be problematic and causes the organizations to pull back and you know and delay some of their plans because of that initial experience. Um, and that's what I think needs to be looked at. And then also, because you're moving to the cloud, how you operate it internally, it's changing, right? Because now your data's out there, how you have your, your data backup plan, recovery plan's gonna change, um, as well as the, you know, continuous security becomes so much more critical when you're in the cloud because there's so many more things, Amen. moving parts that can change in the cloud environment that weren't changing in the legacy environment because you had more rigid change control. I would call it like the waterfall change control compared to the agile process of uh, change control when you go into a DevOps environment and start to introduce uh, 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 secure DevOps as well. Um, and also, you don't have the resources in many cases to address that. You know, so it's not like you're just going to go hire 25 people that have expertise in that area. So you also have to look at you know, partnering to get yourself moving forward in that direction. So those would be some of the key things I think the CISO has to think about as he starts on his cloud migration journey. And, and also, most people, if they're an enterprise organization, are not going to go 100% cloud. It's going to be a hybrid cloud strategy. For sure. I'm, I see the exact same thing. And I think, you know, you mentioned one thing that's interesting there. There's there's a lot of false starts that happen. Com they start and then they realize um, that maybe they didn't think this through good enough and mm -hmm. they and they pull back. And um, unfortunately, the, you know, there's not a recipe. There's not a cookbook that says, you know, 
A through Z, if you do these things, then you'll have a good cloud migration strategy because it's different, I think, for different verticals, um, in different kind of um, architectures, different kind of infrastructures. So, um, so it's a challenge. There's no doubt about it. So, so Mark, back to you on the on this very same thing. We talked about testing earlier. How do you see um, addressing these challenges of migrating to the cloud, or migrating, yeah. or determining a good hybrid strategy using uh, testing? Well, it's one of those things you need to address up front when you're selecting your vendor. Um, all the different vendors have uh, what they allow for different types of testing. They're all different. So when you're doing your evaluation, you need to look on their websites, and that changes periodically. So some will allow you um, to conduct tests against them unannounced, as long as it's just the customer um, that's there. Um, others will require you to submit a form and approval, which can delay. So it's just another factor to put in your, your acquisition uh, decision. But you can test against these environments. Now, I think early on there was a lot of confusion, who owns what. Yeah. Um, but they, There still is, by the way. Yeah, but I think they've gotten a little more clear with each one on the website putting the boundary lines and what notifications you need. So that's been an improvement, I'd say, in the last two or three years. But so, um, go ahead. Just a comment from someone that see that on the, from the outside. I see, I see companies that, uh, you know, look at the cloud as a new environment and try to figure out what are their new terms and conditions to operate there. And those that try to take the on-premises version and see how they can mesh it into this cloud. And yeah. this is a recipe for disaster. Yeah, yeah that, but a lot of that's, uh, you know, I think that's where that recipe would come in handy. You know, if you could go, down and, and you could make some of these decisions before you sure. got in that kind of a mess. Yeah. yeah. Um, we have a, a, we have quite a few questions from the audience here, so I'm going to take a few of them now. Um, so the first one, and I get, I'll start with you, Joe, but please, everyone else, jump in here. What kind of advice do you that have for those who dabble but are not officially in CISO roles? What studying is worthwhile? What isn't? I mean, it's kind of like a have at it, Joe. <laughs> so, um, you know, besides the basic foundations of, you know, of getting, you know, your credentials, I truly think that if you're going, if you're looking to become a CISO, you also need to understand your business, and you need to understand how security enables your business. Because if you're able to utilize security as an enabler, help grow your business, then you'll be very successful in that role. I mean, if you're going to come in with, you know, just talk about fear, uh, it's not going to help you. You know, that, that was maybe a CISO 15, 20 years ago. Today, you really need to be talking about how you're going to enable your business with, with security. Yeah. Uh, and so those would be the key things that I would be advising anybody who wants to become a CISO to focus on because they're truly looking for a business partner. They're not looking for a security expert. Yeah. Any thoughts on that, Mark? Yeah, I would say the... You know, being um, being okay dealing with things you can't control. Um, you know, your day is not going to be normal. So <laughs> get used to it and, and embrace it, right? Um, and dealing with those stressful situations, because if you want to pursue that path, you will be put in them. So, so keeping cool and, and focusing on your priorities is, is one of those ones that I found um, successful CISOs are good at. So here's another one, um, kind of a, an, an advice question. I feel like Dear Abby up here. <laughs> um, what do you think about the importance of CISOs having a technical background um, and understanding their environments to enable better judgment, um, as opposed to, I guess, you know, becoming be, being more of a generalist, generalist or a, um, a policy kind of a person? I think it goes to your earlier comment that you cannot be a security expert yeah. anymore, right? And uh, if that's the case, you really need the army of good people that are experts in specific areas. So being a very technical guy that knows everything, you know, uh, you know, it, it's it's not valid anymore, right? So uh, for me, the more important is to be able to know the organization, you know, how it works, you know, the yep. different systems, you know. What 
what impact what that that being able to have this broad view and understand that that's the key yeah I agree um, I think um, the well there's yeah there's there's just so many different things there's so many facets of this um, that I think a, having a good you have to have some understanding of technology sure. I don't think you need to be you know the uber geek propeller head any longer um, in fact you know you have to ha you have to be really well rounded and broad I mean I'm I'm working on a talk uh, for another thing and uh, it's all around you know how much of a, a, a legal background or a legal understanding does today's CISO need to have because of all the regulations and compliance requirements I mean Sometimes I feel like I need a law degree for crying out loud to be a CISO today. Um, it's very much focused too on risk management. You're right because you can't yeah. just be, you can't go and say I want to be 100% secure and get the budget for that. Yeah. So you have to be acceptable of risk and make the right calls, and that that is probably the hardest part I think when you're placed in that position as a first time because it is you making that decision yeah. versus you know where you might have suggested the decision before yeah. the one thing i want to bring up related to the to that topic re is that you know today the CISO has to think of the risk management person and the legal staff as his partner yeah as well Absolutely. as sourcing right um and, and if you have to have a very good relationship with all those groups which traditionally CISOs didn't think about but I'm telling you, that's super critical. Oh my gosh! In today's job, because you know, in my role, you know, I deal with those people all the time, uh, and that's the only way you effectively get things done quickly. Because if you don't have yeah. a good working relationship with them, you're not getting anything done. They can like they can give you the hand. You can install you forever. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So we are almost out of time, believe it or not. Um, so let's take a, a minute or two, and just each of you. Um, what do you think some of the biggest challenges, what do you think the biggest challenge facing a CISO today is? Um, you could probably go with the talent shortage or just the rapid changing technology environment that you have to adapt to. Um, you know, with, with mergers and acquisitions, staff turnover, it, you kind of want to look at it as a static thing, but it's just ever evolving. Hmm. And, and I think that's tough to handle and put, a, put a, your grips around. I um, I think that you know. Well, we all know that CISOs and the teams are bombarded with alerts and vulnerabilities and and risk and risk levels, and I think that the big challenge is to translate it into relevancy. Not every alert, even if it's high, is relevant, right? And the way to sort out and to figure out out of all the things that you see what is relevant, because you do some other things that can mitigate it and therefore it's not relevant, right? The ability to reduce that to the relevant ones and find the right controls that will reduce the, the, the total number to the very small relevant one is the key element. I think that artificial intelligence can help in that a little yeah. bit. Uh, I think that um, I think that CISOs should try to start adopting, I mean, artificial intelligence as a, must, as, as a top player, right? Not as part of each silo. Uh, because that will help them in the next level of the decision because the number of alerts they're going to get is not going to drop. Okay. I tell you. You know, it's just uh, going to I'm be higher and higher. Joe? So I would say the biggest challenge that CISOs face today is simplicity. Being able to take all the various data points, all the factors that are going on and all the different elements of their security program and to roll that up and simplify it to get the key messages out. And that is really uh, Nirvana, right? If you can be able to do that as a CISO and simplify the message to your colleagues at your level, at the level above you, at the board level, then you can have an effective program. But that's where a lot of CISOs still struggle is to sim being able to s simplify the key messages. Yeah. So I, my friend Tony Sager, um, heard him say many times, uh, 10 years ago, he said, um, the way for the future CISO to succeed is to automate everything that you possibly can. And when you get done with that, automate everything else. Um, and I think, you know, 
a decade ago Tony said that and you know where we are today we to your exact point we need we don't have enough arms and legs and eyeballs and fingers to do everything we need to do so automation of technology um, streamlining um, our processes is the, the is the biggest challenge for for CISOs today I think so that's going to wrap our uh, our talk today. Thank you all for joining. Um, sorry I couldn't get to all the questions. Uh, we did get to a few, but um, please feel free to share this with your friends if uh, if you found anything enlightening in here. And uh, thank you for joining.